Hey there, Internet. I'm screen actor Sam Lukowski, and you're watching Pretentious Opinions. Hey, Ralphie. Hey, man. <laughs> Welcome to my yeah. shitty internet show. It's good to be in Atlanta. <laughs> it, yeah. Hey, man. I'm glad you're here. All right. So let me do this legal thing real quick that no one wants to do. <clears throat> Before we go any further, could you please confirm for the record that you were indeed over the age of 18. You are a legal citizen of these United States. Most importantly, you are of sound body and mind. And therefore, give me your informed consent to post this entire conversation for free on the internet. I do. <laughs> well, thank you. Welcome to the show. It's a yeah. show, but it's my show. And I actually have you live. Most people, they don't get to be here, for real. So thank you. Live and eating a tangerine. There you go, man. Hey, I, look. I got my, my mug of my mug of something. Alrighty. <clears throat> How's that sound? Is that clipping for you, Zach? <laughs> All right, let's start off uh, with you introducing who you are to our viewers. My name is Rafael Alvarez. I'm a screenwriter and author from Baltimore. Baltimore. <laughs> Uh, Gallows. I um, was a reporter for 20 years for the Baltimore Sun. I uh, am a lifetime uh, resident of the city of Baltimore, where I was uh, educated in Catholic schools. I spent about five years in L.A. in the uh, early aughts, mid-aughts, writing for network television, and now I'm currently on a uh, one tour to promote my new collection of short stories. Well, since you've already brought it up, let's do the little plug right now. <laughs> Zach will probably put up a graphic, but, you know, in the meantime, <laughs> you want to say what it this is. is uh, this is the 20th anniversary edition of my first book, which was called The Fountain of Highland Town. This one is called Basilio Bullosa, Stars in the Fountain of Highland Town, and leave it to a knucklehead like me to give my book a tongue-twisting title. <laughs> Uh, but uh, so far, so good. I hit the road on Tuesday, July 11th. So far, I've uh, appeared in D.C., which went really well, uh, at the D.C. Art Center, then uh, Chapel Hill, and uh, a couple nights ago on Pauley's Island, South Carolina, where we had a great turnout. And tonight, I am at the SAG-AFTRA Conservatory In, that's it. In Atlanta. It's, it's in old. Atlanta. In Atlanta. Was I not supposed to say that? No, you're good. Man. Oh, okay. You go. You go. Yeah. All right. So, did you fall in love with Baltimore when you were a journalist, or did it go back before then? Oh, it it's like, it it's like loving your mom and dad. I mean, it's it's indelible. It's the it's the some people maybe hate where they grew up, but I never did, and. Um, you know, you and I have the connection through the tugboats, your father and your grandfather. And uh, when you've got a dad who works on the tugboats in the Baltimore Harbor, it's not hard to fall in love with the city. And then, of course, my pedigree is all old school working class Baltimore. My Polish grandfather worked for the National Brewery. Uh, his wife, my Polish grandmother, uh, worked in canneries during the Depression and during World War II, actually was in a sweatshop that made uh, canvas sandbags for the Allies. My father's father uh, worked at the shipyard, and um, I got a taste of what I would call the real Baltimore before it was gone, able to go down to neighborhoods where your father was raised, Fells Point, back in the early 60s, and it was still a real seaman's neighborhood. It, it definitely, uh, you could definitely just imagine you were hanging out with Joseph Conrad or Herman Melville. <laughs> now, I didn't know those cats when I was six years old, but um, I've been in love with Baltimore uh, my whole life. And now, you've written several books about Baltimore. You already mentioned The Fountainhead of Highland Town in your new book. Uh, Not The Fountainhead. That's... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, The Fountain, sorry. That, that would be that uh, that dirty, rotten... <laughs> that dirty, rotten Ann Rand... Uh, You're not bitter, are you? No. <laughs> it's called The Fountain of Highland Town. Yeah. Anyway, yes, yeah. I've written uh, this. The new book is my 11th published book. Well, I have I have Storyteller, Hometown Boy. What is it? Orlo and... Lenny. Orlo and Lenny. Orlo and Lenny. And then Tales from the Holy Land. Yeah. What else do you have? 
I have a history of the Archdiocese of Baltimore. I have a history of um, a pioneering drug treatment center in Baltimore called the Turk House, which uh, existed long before Betty Ford in those places. I uh, wrote the encyclopedia that accompanies The Wire, which I wrote for in the first three seasons. That's called Truth Be Told, The Wire. And um, that might be it. That might get us to 11. <laughs> oh, Crabtown, USA. Crabtown. Crabtown, USA. So my books are split between um, fiction and nonfiction. Uh, there are seven nonfiction books, and uh, Basilio Briosa is my fourth uh, collection of short fiction. Oh, you, you said you worked for HBO's The Wire. You were a writer for that show. And you worked on NBC's Homicide, Life on the Streets, The Black Donnellys, and Life. How the hell did you get into screenwriting? You went from journalism to screenwriting. Because I had the uh, good fortune um, to be a young reporter with David Simon on The Baltimore Sun. Uh, we were actually desk mates uh, in the newsroom. And we're sort of the same generation. I think David might be two years younger than me. And we chased news, cops and robbers, and then would party all night and play basketball at midnight in this little waterfront church where I had the keys. And uh, we would party and go to each other's homes and attend each other's weddings. <laughs> well, in plural, weddings. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, in... So David took a buyout from the Baltimore Sun in 93 when uh, Homicide, Life on the Street, which was based on his book called Homicide, uh, was being uh, developed by um, Barry Levinson for NBC. I, I did not really write, I did not really work for Homicide. I, I, I freelanced one script mm. that appeared in 97 called All is Bright. And then um, I took the buyout from the Sun in 01. As you know, newspapers have had a rough time of it in the last 20 years or so. And uh, when I, I I took the buyout and went to work on a ship, I did what I, I put myself through uh, Loyola College in Baltimore working on a ship. My dad, being in the Seafarers International Union for many, many years, was able to get me a gig um, uh, as a deckhand on a, on a container ship. And... Um, Simon knew that he was going to have a season of The Wire that dealt with uh, the death of organized labor as uh, symbolized by the port, the longshoremen. And uh, so when I was in my second summer uh, in the, uh, I guess it was around 02, uh, working on the ship, um, I had already freelanced a script for season one of The Wire, and then he invited me to join the staff for season two. And then once you write for The Wire, you know, and it became <laughs> this this really big deal, uh, it was very, uh, it wasn't that difficult to start getting gigs out in L.A. You know, I have good representation. Um, and I worked out there on shows beginning with FX. There was a show called Thief in which Andre Brower won an Emmy for Best uh, Lead Actor in a uh, miniseries. From there, I went to the Black Donnellys, and from there, I went to Life. Um, and then the Writers Guild of America went on strike in October of 07. We stayed on strike until uh, February of 08. I was a strike captain. I was very involved. Um, it was all about getting royalties from streaming. Management in the studio said there was no future in streaming. <laughs> <laughs> So why would we... Just, just so that you guys yeah. know this, mm. now in 2017, my union, the Screen Actors Guild, we just finished negotiating contracts on on streaming for three years. We still got more in the future. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's you no see. future. <laughs> future. The network platform was imploding. Uh, I think we were asking for two to three pennies per rerun on streaming. But anyway, uh, after the strike ended, NBC uh, told me they no longer had use for my uh, contributions, and I came back to Baltimore mm -hmm. and uh, devoted myself to my first love, which is uh, writing books. Now, quite famously, The Wire, as you said, has been hailed as one of the most successful HBO series of all time. And I am no, a... not successful, important. important. There's a okay. lot of successful okay. and important aren't the same That's thing. That's true. And I am a huge fan. I mean, I got stuff right here. I watch it all the time. But there's also quite a bit of negative outcry from some of the critics. Some critics have stated that The Wire painted 
uh, an unflattering picture of Baltimore City. How do you feel about the series and, and, and some of the negative backlash? Well, I would love for the uh, city government of Baltimore, uh, the mayor, which is it's a strong mayor uh, form of government, and the city council, and the representatives and the people of Baltimore to paint a flattering portrait of Baltimore. You give us a flattering Baltimore and we'll make a show that is a flattering portrait of Baltimore. Uh, it's a great city. I love it. Um, but it's got some serious problems. And um, every time we would get criticized for uh, a portrayal of something that was uh, not very uh, appealing in um, terms of promoting the city, uh, the next day's 7 o'clock news would trump us with an atrocity we couldn't even dream of. So uh, in many ways, The Wire was a documentary. Um, we focused on the uh, sadder part of the city because half the city lives that way. Um, and More, these more are, than half in some places. And these are people that, uh, that deserve a break. I don't know how that break's going to come about. I don't really know what the answer is, uh, but... Um, the problem of drugs is huge. Baltimore has been the heroin capital of, of, at least before the opioid epidemic. We were known for heroin going all the way back to the 1930s, Billy Holiday and all that stuff. Um, and, uh, and there are no jobs. Baltimore was a great city when uh, your grandfather and my father were young men. Um, you could always get a job on the waterfront. <clears throat> uh, the fat cats, uh, I love this Springsteen song um, called Youngstown, in, in which he looks at a, uh, the narrator looks at a uh, factory in ruins and says those big boys did what Hitler couldn't do. And we, those big boys, uh, those big boys work on Wall Street. Um, bring the jobs back, I think address, uh, address the profoundly entrenched drug problem, and maybe we'll have uh, a chance at a better future. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, now, uh, let's see. Can you talk to me a little bit about uh, what it's like to be a writer for hire? Like for me, yeah. for me, well, because like me as an actor, like here's how it works. Uh, as a union actor, I make a living paycheck to paycheck, uh, looking for the next audition. But I'm sure you don't audition as a writer. So how does it work? And how do you? How do you? What do you do to like make ends meet? When you're not working on a show, I, I may I mostly do freelance journalism. Is is how I make ends meet, and there's no union for that. That's I work for a, a handful of magazines and websites, and uh, every once in a while a newspaper. And um, that was a uh, a community I was able to establish because of my work at the Baltimore Sun. When it comes to screenplays, uh, I often get um, uh, people are. Uh, interested in having me write for them, usually um, independent, excuse me, usually independent filmmakers. And I say, look, you got to go through my agent and and the Writers Guild of America. Well, you want me to look at the camera? No, I'm, I'm telling the, the <laughs> audience, like, see, if you want to make money, you got to spend some money. Well, just... <laughs> I mean, I don't have to spend any money. You know, they have to spend the money if they want to hire me. Um, and... Uh, it's only because of the Writers Guild of America and the union, the and you and I and you and I may have different opinions on this, but hey, it was only because of um, your grandfather and my father's union contract that put me in college. They mm -hmm. let us live in the suburbs that um, that launched us into the middle class. Yep. Uh, so yeah, I totally agree. Like I, when I was non-union, I made no money, like nothing. Yeah. So when I switched to becoming a part of the Screen Actors Guild and the, the American Federation, oh God, I'm going to screw it up. And now my union reps are going to kill me. SAG after. When I joined, now I get a paycheck. So yeah. it's like, it's total, you know, sometimes it's accidental and sometimes it's just total exploitation. So I get So, it. I mean, I, I, I am a writer for hire. That means, you know, I have people who say to me, um, hire him. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sometimes that's $25, man. I just mm -hmm. did a book mm -hmm. review for the Washington Independent Review of Books, which uh, is a nonprofit, and, and I'm very supportive of it. Uh, you know, I read a book. I spent the day reviewing it, and I got 25 bucks. But uh, it's honest work. And, um, you know, and then on the other end, you know, I've written pilots for $100,000. That's only happened once or twice. Uh, but it certainly came in handy when my kids were in college. Um, Do you want to maybe plug... 
Oh, a certain, oh. <laughs> certain someone who is a also a performing <laughs> artist. Uh, my daughter Amelia Alvarez Champion or Amelia Champion is a working uh, actor and member of SAG in good standing in L.A. Mm-hmm. Uh, she she pays her bills with uh, with national commercials for people like Dodge and and Toyota and things like that, while appearing in indie films, and. Uh, it, SAG at least and, and, and the Guild as, as we've gotten more and more into the do-it-yourself um, independent film world they, they are flexible it's not as, 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 as airtight as people think where you're locked in to you're either going to pay uh, a writer 50 grand or he can't work for you it, uh, sometimes they will um, they will measure or scale, scale. They'll, they'll scale the, uh, the fees to the budget of the project involved sagindie.org guys just go there they'll help you they will help you get your production done man for just you just gotta you gotta be willing to do it you do you want to be a professional or what so yeah and and (laughs) uh, hey you know no one gives a shit if you do it or not as i my son uh jake is a uh a cartoonist in 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 philly and he's self-taught and um i told him from the time he was a young boy the, the world doesn't care whether you do your art or not. I mean, does the world need another short story? Does the world need another independent film? Probably not. So you better care whether you do it or not. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. All right. Well, look, all I want you to do now is just plug where we can find you. Websites, social media, anything. We'll put up graphics so they can find it in the links and stuff. Yeah, my Facebook page is the best place to go. I, 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 um, I post everything I do there, all the new books, all the new stories. Uh, just Rafael Alvarez with an F. Check it out. On Facebook. And if anybody just Googles Rafael Alvarez and the word Baltimore, all my stuff will come <laughs> up. It'll all come up. And uh, I email strangers all the time, meaning that if you dig my stuff and you want to chat about it, send me a note. I do not talk on the telephone, <laughs> except to my mother and my wife because they make me. But other than that, uh, I'm online all day long. Cool. Hey, Ralphie, thanks again for You're coming welcome. That You're hurt. welcome. That was live, though. <laughs> Did you guys hear that? That was live. <laughs> God bless. Yeah, thank you, guys.